Well, good afternoon and thanks for joining our webinar today. I'm uh, Elliot Dennis, Assistant Professor and Extension Livestock Economist in the Department of Agricultural Economics at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And today is a special Tuesday presentation for the Center of Agricultural Profitability weekly webinar series, which generally happens Thursday at noon central. A full schedule is available on our website at cap.unl.edu. And it's important to note that this webinar is the first part of a two-part series on the state and future opportunities for meat, meat processing with a particular focus on Nebraska today. This Thursday, the Center for Agriculture Profitability will also present the second part focusing on meat processing consolidation and grant opportunities for new and existing processing plants. Today, we'll be looking at the types of meat processing plants and their locations to discuss the financial concerns associated with starting a new meat processing plant, as well as address some legal issues that should be considered when deciding on either a custom exempt or federally inspected plant. Joining me today to present is Charlie McPherson, Center Director with the uh, Nebraska Business Development Center at the University of Nebraska Omaha, and Dave Aiken, an Agricultural and Water Specialist in the Department of Agricultural Economics at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I'll go ahead and start us off today by discussing the types of meat processing plants and their locations, and then we'll pass it off to Charlie. We'll discuss the financial concerns associated with starting meat processing plants, and then Dave will wrap us up today uh, to discuss some legal issues uh, associated with uh, custom exempt and federally inspected plants. We do encourage questions. If you do have questions during the webinar, please put those in the Q&A box or the chat and we'll answer those at the end. Our goal is to have 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A. And so feel free to ask those questions as we go, uh, go with the webinar. I will go ahead and begin. Okay, well, I thought it would be good to uh, first point out why we're having these types of conversations in the first place. Uh, a lot of this, these started questions about concerns about slaughter capacity and slaughter plants in general really started in the middle of 2019 um, and were, was further expanded in 2020. Over here on the left-hand side is uh, slaughter capacity. This is all commercial slaughter, so that's federal inspected and non-federal inspected slaughter. Um, and this is on a, on a weekly basis. And really what we see here is that we're pointing to is this right here that really happened. This was the Holcomb fire right here. This was really the COVID-19 incidents and this is further labor issues that we've, we've been having. And so the reason why this is a particular concern for people who let's say have uh, harvest ready cattle is that those animals are on feed um, and they're ready to go to harvest right now, but we don't have available space. Um, and so this created a larger issue about should we be expanding uh, pat processing capacity and particular, should we be providing opportunities for smaller or medium range processing plants in the US? While this was happening at the same time, we had this larger trend that was happening and really was this, uh, this price spreads between retail and processing and processing to uh, um, the basically the, the farm level prices. So what I have displayed over here on the right hand side is uh, those price series specifically for cattle that's uh, been widely talked about over the last six months. On the left hand side, this is for uh, the wholesale and farm level prices and on the right hand side, or the right axis is the retail price. What we see is this retail price up until about 2015, they, those price spreads tended to follow each other pretty closely. And then as we were coming out of the drought in 2016 and high feeder cattle prices, we started to see those diverge quite, quite aggressively. And so this kind of led to further concerns that potential issues in, in meat processing and um, finding ways to, for producers to capture a larger share of the marketing dollar. So that's kind of where we're at today. Uh, on Thursday, I'll discuss a little bit more about meat consult or processing plant consolidation, where that's happened and 
uh, what type of plants have we seen that consolidation in. But particularly we're gonna, today, we're going to be focusing on the types of meat processing plants that actually exist that lead us to get to this slaughter capacity number here. So really there's four broad types of meat processing plants. Uh, we tend to focus a lot on the first type, which is the federally inspected um, by the US Department of Agriculture, Food Safety and Inspection Service, sometimes commonly referred to as USDA FSIS. But there's also three different types of, or three different types of meat processing plants that can also exist. They have the Cooperative Interstate Shipping Program, which is essentially just a joint venture between USDA and state, state meat inspection programs that allow uh, processing to be, or product to be shipped across state lines. We have traditional state run inspection meat processing plants. So pro meat that's processed, those plants can only be sold within the state's bound, uh, borders. And then we have this fourth category, which we, uh, we know the least amount about, and that's custom exempt facilities. Uh, and th the purpose of custom exempt is that meat is not labeled for retail sale and only the owner of the meat can consume it. And so where we've seen some of the programs that developed particularly here in, in Wyoming and in Nebraska uh, with the herd share programs, it's kind of getting around federal inspection to get at uh, custom exempt facilities. So there is a lot of information out there on, we ha I know we have people from other states besides Nebraska on today. Uh, for more information on where these plants are located and whether your state participates in, these, uh, in this program, you can uh, access these, these links. This is for the federally inspected. It provides a nice visualization, both the size and the type of plant uh, within your state. This is whether your state actually participates in the Cooperative Interstate Shipping Program. Also same here, whether your state actually has state inspected uh, facilities. And really where, uh, what we don't know a lot about is where these locations of these custom exempt plants are. Uh, oftentimes these are on li private lists that people just compile themselves or compiled at the uh, State Department of Agriculture. At the end of this, um, of this, of my presentation, we're gonna be providing a Google form that you can go in and we're trying to compile this, actively compile this list of where those state or process, custom exempt processing plants are in Nebraska. So if you know of a, of a plant or you use a plant, please put that information in there so that we can compile this and, and then we will share it out um, to the public. So right now I wanted to be uh, open up a poll question if you go ahead and participate in this and it's, uh, during this uh, shutdown, we had a lot of people using meat processing or custom exempt plants. So just curious, how many people or how many times in the last uh, year or have you actually participated or sold your cattle to a, or cattle or hogs or um, another type of animals over the last year sold to a custom exempt plant? Ryan, I think we need the other question up. Let me give the custom exempt here. Let me launch this question. Sorry about that, guys. Let's, if you could go ahead and answer this question. How many times in the last two years have you used a custom exempt plant to harvest animals? We'll have about 10 more seconds. All right. Go ahead and end this poll. We'll go ahead and share these results here. So about 45% of people have never used a custom exempt plant over the last couple of years. Looks like uh, majority or 
a larger share of 42% have used it anywhere between one to five times, then we have a, a few people who use them uh, quite, quite frequently. Just interesting, just wanted to see kind of where we're at um, uh, in the state. So this is why we tend to focus on federally inspected processing plants. I, I could put this up for different types of commodities. I'm specifically going to be focusing on calf and cattle and calf slaughter today. And what I did is basically calculated the share of total production uh, for federally for animals that went through federally inspected plants versus those that went through um, other types of plants. And so what we can actually see is really since the you know 1990s, about 97 to 98% of all cattle and calf harvested in the US were processed at federally inspected plants. And so while we may focus on state inspected plants or um, custom exempt plants, most of the meat processing that will happen in the US, in this case for, for cattle, is going to be done at federally inspected plants. And so the question, the second question that we have is, um, how many federally inspected plants in Nebraska, regardless of the size, do we have? Um, if we can launch the second question. What, what do we think? 47, 66 plants, 91 plants, 113, 154. Yeah, we'll wait about 10 more seconds. Okay, so this is what we had. Uh, most people said about 47, about 55% of people said that there was 47 federally inspected plants, a little bit um, fewer as we go down. So in Nebraska, we actually have 113 federally inspected plants. And this is uh, a table that really shows within Nebraska and across the different states, how many federally inspected plants that, uh, that are available. This is from USDA FSIS database. I went ahead to compile this. So if we're looking at total plants, this is the column we're gonna be looking at for here in Nebraska, 113 if we're from Iowa, 143. And then we can look at the size as defined by HACCP, whether they're defined as a very small plant, small plant, or a large plant. So in Nebraska, the way to read this is there are 35 federally inspected plants that are, that are categorized as very small, 50 that are categorized as uh, small, and large that are categorized, or 15 that are categorized as large. So that's how we read this size column over here. We look at the type of commodities. So we know that uh, different commodity or different processing plants can actually uh, process multiple uh, types of commodities, or they can choose to specialize in, in one type of commodity. So that's what this right-hand column is over here. If we go down to Nebraska, there are about 30 federal inspected plants across all these different sizes that process beef. Um, 20 that process pork, uh, 15 that process other meat products, two that, and two that uh, harvest pol uh, poultry products. So this gives an idea that you know, we tend to think that there's very few of them, but there's actually quite a few of them, but, but the size might be uh, the factor that we're looking at. So where are these, plant, where are these plants located? Uh, we're gonna go through just briefly here, uh, where are these plants? So right here for folks in Nebraska, and I just uh, pulled and plotted what this would look like for all the other states. You can see kind of where you're at in the state or in, in your own state and see where those plants are likely near you. Um, this is, just to clarify, this is across all types of commodities that they're processing and all sizes of plants. Um, and so there are a few opportunities when we can see kind of clustering greater here in, in Iowa and Missouri, 
Uh, and when we're talking about different types of processing, that can vary as well. So where are these plants located by commodity type here in Nebraska? We can, like I said, we can do this for other uh, commodities as for other states as well. For beef, this is primarily where these plants are located. And this is of course across all different uh, sizes. So this would be kind of your big ones, JBS, Cargill, right? And then we have our pork processing plants over here, other red meat processing plants and our, our poultry processing plants over here. And poultry, poultry, poultry processing is relatively new with the emergence of Costco um, and other uh, uh, contract growing. And then this is kind of what we, we say, regardless of commodity type, where, what's the size of these, these types of plants? Where are they located? This, once again, size is defined by uh, HACCP um, categorizations. Really, we see right, Greater Omaha, JBS, Cargill um, for these large processing plants. And even uh, then we have quite a few more smaller plants and uh, quite a few very, very small plants. What I wanted to point out is that most of these small and very small plants are located in, in more rural areas. And so when we're talking about these grant opportunities or the viability of these, uh, those small or very small processing plants may be more viable in, in more rural areas. And that kind of gives us an idea of, you know, of where these plants are located. And when we start talking about size and whether we should be developing a plant, uh, it's one of the things that uh, has really kind of come to light with COVID-19 is this idea of resilience versus being efficient. Ideally, we want to have large plants that can run lots and lots of animals very quickly. And what that does from economics, we know that it reduces the basically the cost per unit. Um, but what happens is if we have an incident like the Holcomb fire or even what we thought was going to happen in Grand Island it, with air fire, or even COVID-19 where we have labor shortages, when we take off large capacity at one time, it can cause a lot of disruptions. And so we, as an industry, we're still trying to figure out, you know, how much are we willing to be less efficient so that we can be resilient or be responsive to uh, issues that happen in, in meat processing. And I also wanna point out that there are novel programs that are starting to be uh, presented Particularly, uh, uh, Professor Aiken will talk about this herd share program that's been recently passed here in Nebraska. And if you're interested in this, and after listening to what Charlie says, that you're interested in potentially starting a, a meat processing plant, working with him to develop those financials, recognize that this Thursday we'll have uh, an opportunity to, to talk about what funding opportunities are out there and what the university can do to help you. And what I would point out there is that uh, is that all of this conversation is happening when we're at the what we call the the peak of the cattle cycle. Right now, we have as much inventory as we're ever going to have, and herd liquidation has already started to happen. And so, if we are going to start constructing these plants, by the time those plants are done being constructed, we're actually going to be at you know the bottom near the bottom of the cattle cycle, which is where cattle or other types of commodities are actually gonna be at their, their highest peak or their, their being the most expensive. So understanding where we're at when we're building these, uh, these plants as well um, can have an impact. And with that, I'll turn that over to Charlie. We'll talk a little bit more about the financial aspect of, of starting these plants. Well, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Uh, I am Charlie McPherson. I am the center director for North Platte and McCook for the Nebraska Business Development Center. Um, predominantly what I do is provide one-on-one -on -one consulting to 
uh, individuals uh, for in all facets of business, everything from startup to expansion, uh, purchasing a business all the way to exiting. Uh, we also assist with everything from developing business plans to financial, financial projections, to market research, operations and management, and the list kind of goes on and on from there. Um, so one of the major things when, when getting into a type of project or venture of this sort, uh, the, the financial aspect is, is very big, but I just briefly want to kind of go over the uh, research and planning aspect um, of any new operation. It's critical, it's a cr crucial stage to the development and startup process. A well-researched and written business plan lays out the operation on paper before any money is spent. It allows you to put thought and effort and time and conduct everything methodically before it goes into that part. It also allows individuals to identify potential problems, challenges, risks uh, involved, uh, um, be strategic with their thought processes and set goals, uh, both short-term and long-term uh, of the operation. Uh, the business plan also allows uh, individuals to get realistic and look at their numbers and projections for the entire project. Uh, some financial considerations. It takes a uh, significant infrastructure to run this type of operation. Uh, you need significant steady volume to help support it. Uh, producers need to find processors to find good processors and reward them with business so they continue to invest in their infrastructure as well, not just in buildings and equipment, but it also takes highly skilled employees. Um, to keep delivering excellent, excellent quality products. Uh, the processing business is complex and high risk, oftentimes with uh, thinner profit margins. Uh, a, a simple new facility often costs uh, around a million dollars or more, looking at roughly around three to $400 a square foot on average uh, in that development for a new building, new, new project. Uh, in order to justify it, it's uh, a, a processor and financial backers must be confident uh, that it will pre be profitable. In order to do this, you must have a uh, significant and sustained demand for processing services or essentially enough farmers and ranchers who commit to bringing uh, enough livestock in con consistently uh, throughout the year, paying what the process actually costs. Productivity revenue and services offered are all interconnected. The more productivity, the more revenue. The more revenue, the more services a processor can provide and add additional services as well. So this is just a quick snapshot of three examples uh, that are based on real processors. Um, I did see somebody come up with a question that said, what is the difference between them? Uh, this kind of gives you a quick snapshot look at the difference between a very small custom exempt, uh, a small inspected and regional inspected type facilities. I'm not going to go through every one of these, but you can see the difference uh, on the size of the facilities, uh, what they offer, uh, what they don't offer, all the way up to uh, the amount of employees that's often involved in, in these types of facilities. So some of these cost analysis, facility costs, uh, it will cost around, like I said, $400 per square foot for a new construction. The price usually includes permits, site prep, utility, uh, property, building, refrigeration, and other costs for uh, a smaller 20 head per week plant. Uh, buildings include uh, kill floor, coolers, freezers, processing areas, office space, inspector office, break rooms, a retail area, dock and pens. Uh, a lot of these estimates will depend on wh wh where the plant is built. So by region as well, some of those costs kind of go up and down with the cost of new building materials in the last couple of years of raise, uh, that, that, that cost could go up significantly in some areas. Also, depending on the needs of the plant, it would need to be between three to 4,000 square feet. 
Uh, the cost of the building, a 3,000 square foot plant at 400 square foot would be roughly around $1.2 million. Uh, some people are able to repurpose an existing commercial space. Uh, it is estimated that the cost could be around $150 per square foot to renovate it and to get it into a facility uh, of adequate operations. Um, but also again, it could climb depending on your area and cost materials. Typically the cost for equipment for slaughter and processing, which includes rails, hand tools, cookers, smokers, and grinders are estimated between 300 and $400,000. Um, just kind of wanted to read uh, an example that I found to get, give you a perspective. A researcher found that a 1300 pound steer at $1.12 per pound that steer is going to cost uh, $1,456. Then throw in $675 for the slaughter cost. Total cost per animal will be about $2,131, assuming no credit for the drop of hides, offal, bone, or fat, unless you can find some special marketing such as smoking meats or making, making it into pet treats. They also found that a 1300 pound steer after a 62% dress will have a hot carcass weight of about 806 pounds. The 806 pound carcass will have about a 60% cut yield. So you'll end up with about 484 pounds of meat to sell off that steer. Then they go on to state that that $2,131 to uh, slaughter the animal with 484 pounds of meat would mean you would need to charge $4.40 per pound for all cuts of meat on average. And, not, and they, they, they also go on to state not to use current beef prices since they're un, uh, unrealistic at this time. They recommend use, using uh, historic beef, beef prices within that. Um, in my profession and a lot of what I do, I do get uh, asked fairly frequent questions or just ask for some suggestions and feedback uh, that I wanted to throw out there. Um, often I get asked, how big or small should I go? Um, you wanna be able, it, it, it's hard for me to put a, to guide that individual within that because you wanna make sure there's enough processes to support the, the business in that area. Uh, you also want to consider having enough room for future services or expansion. So if you start small, make sure you're in an area where you have adequate room in case you need to expand. Uh, oftentimes, um, when we're setting up uh, individuals getting ready to go talk to a bank or a lender, uh, they want to know what the banks would like from them. Obviously, first and foremost is a business plan. Uh, usually, that also includes three years of financial projections into that. Uh, personal financial statements, uh, personal finance history. Um, what we try to go over during our uh, consulting is, you know, if this is something that you're looking at starting, how do you how do you gauge interest in a in a business opportunity such as this? Um, oftentimes, we discuss letter commitments or customer commitments. If you have know of a large group of producers in the area that you can go out and talk to if they're willing to put something on paper just to help your cause. Usually that goes over well with the banks as well. Uh, experience also comes into effect and so on from there. Uh, another thing that banks uh, like to look at is regardless of the demand and opportunity for a local meat processor, banks rarely finance 100% of the project which means they will do typically a uh, 70 to 80% loan to value uh, on the project. They also wanna see an investment or skin in the game as they put it on your part. They also take into consideration the applicant's credit worthiness. So credit score, some of those things also come into effect there. Due to uh, some of the high upfront costs in these type of operations, it's good to take into consideration potential partnerships with individuals, uh, investor opportunities, or a cooperative structure to kind of help offset some of those costs. Um, 
some financial opportunities or funding opportunities. Obviously, we have our local banks in our areas and community uh, initiative programs such as the LB840s, uh, the TIF or ta tax increment financing. Um, oftentimes, some areas have uh, initiatives for their industrial parks. They're trying to get up and get going and expand on some of those if they're available. Um, Nebraska economic development um, programs when they're available, USDA loan and grant programs. Currently, uh, they just announced the USDA is launching a $100 million initiative to create more and better market opportunities to strengthen America's food supply chain. Um, and they are looking to expand in the meat and poultry, uh, poultry processing capacity in the United States. Um, other financial programs include uh, rural economic development loans and grants, also known as Red Leg. Red Leg. Uh, this is typically applied through local electric or telephone cooperatives, um, the SBA loan programs as well. So, again, I want to I want to thank you for your time. Um, if you want inf more information or exactly what you do, you can contact me personally. My contact information's there on the screen. Otherwise, if you look at the map in the lower right hand corner, we do have offices throughout the entire state, and you could meet with and uh, talk with any of our consultants. They'd be more than healthy, happy to help you with whatever you need. So I am going to pass it on to Dave and let him take it from there. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. And uh, we will be sharing both our slides and a recording of the presentation. So um, if you didn't get Charlie's information down and you still want to meet with him, uh, it, will, it will be available also uh, in conjunction with the webinar. Okay, I'm Dave Aiken, Ag Law Specialist here at the University of Nebraska. And Elliot asked me to give a little talk about some of the regulatory aspects of this. And so this is sort of like a, a 5,000 foot view, but we'll go ahead. Um, this all started back with a very famous novel uh, in American history, uh, The Jungle by Epton Sinclair. And it, uh, you know, laid out the very unsanitary conditions that then existed in the U.S. meatpacking industry where everything was thrown in, you know, dead rats, you know, whatever they swept off the floor, you know, the occasional worker, all of this, you know, it was, it was pretty gruesome stuff. So Congress, uh, well, President Roosevelt set up a commission to go in and make sure that things were really as bad as Upton Sinclair said they were. And the commission came back and said, you know, they're as bad or maybe even worse. So Roosevelt went to Congress and, and they passed the Meat, Meat Inspection Act. And the purpose of the act was to improve the sanitary conditions of meat slaughter and processing. And food safety is still the main focus uh, of the Meat Inspection Act, and it's administered by the USDA uh, Food Safety and Inspection Service, or FSIS. Uh, Elliot also briefly introduced us uh, to them, but they are the ones who do the meat inspecting. Okay, um, federal inspections and, and Elliot did a great job in terms of laying out what the kind of share of the different size facilities we had in Nebraska. I had no idea we had so many, so many of the small ones uh, or the, the medium sized ones, but the federally ins inspected ones are uh, tend to be the larger processors. Uh, state inspection, uh, if the state undertakes that program, uh, it does, you know, they, they can take over from the federal uh, uh, FSIS, but they have to meet all the federal requirements and they foot and the state foots the bill. Uh, USDA pays the uh, 
federal inspectors, and I'll get to that on the next slide, but, but it basically pays for their basic work week. Uh, and anything above that is on the uh, processor. Uh, but we do not have state inspection in Nebraska. Uh, a wave of states uh, stopped, ended their inspection programs when um, changes to the Meat Inspection Act came in. Uh, and, uh, you know, with the federal incentive that says we'll pay for the the, the inspectors, a lot of states says, great, you pay for it, we don't want to. We'll use that money for something else. And I believe it was 1971 uh, when Nebraska ended its state inspection program. And when we had the hearings on the, uh, uh, on the herd uh, share bill uh, in the legislature and some uh, related proposals, uh, our State Department of Agriculture says we don't support setting up a state inspection program in Nebraska because we would have to pay for it and we would have to do everything that the that the uh, that USDA already does and and you know we don't it would be expensive uh, as far as the state was concerned and they 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 did not come out in favor of it. Uh, that's just for your information. Um, the custom exempt program, uh, this would be your, your kind of local meat lockers who, uh, you know, typically, you know, if, if hunters, you know, get a deer or something like that, then that's where they go uh, to get that uh, the meat processed and stored until they can come pick it up and so forth. That's, uh, that's the, the, that's obviously not all those folks do, but that's, but that's the kind of thing that they, you know, that's the sort of uh, thing that they do. So they are on, they are on the small end. Uh, and I was rather surprised by uh, the previous presentation uh, where it was, you know, the 20 head per week for a relatively small facility, you know, that that was a million dollars or more in terms of, in terms of uh, construction. And, and, you know, so it's, it's pretty expensive to get into even, even at a relatively small level. Okay, then another USDA category is what is called retail exempt. Uh, and that is uh, where all the meat comes from a either USDA inspection or a state inspection uh, packer and processor where the state inspection uh, meets all the federal requirements. And when I have the state with the little asterisk there, that means state inspection program that basically is identical to the USDA program. So it's not that if you get the state inspection that you have a, you know, that they won't inspect them as well or as completely or something like that. You don't, you don't get a break on, you don't get a break on the inspection standards uh, by going to a state inspection program. Uh, so that, you know, that's not anything that to really factor into your thinking in terms of policy changes at the state level. Okay, uh, for facilities to qualify for USDA or uh, USDA approved state inspection, uh, they have to have the food safety plan. Uh, they have to have the, sanit uh, the sanitation standard operating procedures plan. So that's that's a you know an aspect clearly of food safety. Uh, you have to have a recall plan so that if, if the meat is adulterated or something like that, then you can you can trace it and and, and recall it. Uh, you know, so it's there's it's a big deal. Uh, you're getting into a lot of of uh, complicated regulations here. Uh, you'll have to have. Uh, you know, basically your food safety consultants to help you design uh, your facility uh, so that you'll have the appropriate uh, HACCP plan and the SOPP plan, uh, you know, and, and, and that. So it's not a, uh, it's not a do-it-yourself type of deal. It's, it's a, you know, we're talking about expensive, complicated facilities um, that, you know, you're going to need professional assistance with developing, you know, uh, from top to bottom. Uh, 
in addition, as far as the USDA or USDA state approved inspection programs uh, for a, you know, for a processing facility, uh, you have daily uh, inspection of those facilities and for red meat, you have daily inspection of each animal before and after slaughter. So this is all required under the Federal uh, Meat Inspection Act. Okay, uh, the meat products, if they're from a uh, USDA facility, uh, you know, they can go, you know, across state lines and um, internationally, uh, you know, to many countries. If it's state inspected, uh, can go any, anywhere within the state. If you go, if you get additional approval from USDA, uh, then you can uh, participate in that interstate uh, shipment program that, uh, that Elliot mentioned in his presentation. Uh, but, you know, if it's USDA inspected, then it can be sold, you know, the grocery stores, restaurants, you know, hotels, whatever, you know, they'll be, they'll come out with the label, it'll have the, the USDA grade on it, whether it's USDA prime and so on and so forth. Uh, and my expectation is that, you know, if it's a major processing facility, it's going to be uh, USDA inspected. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly in Nebraska, uh, USDA pays the basic work week. Uh, if the packer wants them to work overtime or on a holiday, then that extra pay, that overtime pay and holiday pay comes from uh, the packer. Uh, the state inspection programs, you know, if they want to do, if they want to basically take the place of the USDA inspection program with a state program, you know, it has to meet all the USDA requirements. Uh, and uh, the facilities, same thing for the facilities. If they want to, you know, have meat that's can move in commerce and 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 that, then uh, it does. Uh, it has to, you know, whoever inspects it, it's going to be going to have to. Uh, they're they're going to be have to meet all the USDA requirements, including all the facility requirements like the HACCP plan, the recall plan, and so forth. And uh, USDA does not pay for state inspectors, and that's probably a big reason why we have more USDA inspection uh, and less uh, state inspection uh, than we had maybe 40, uh, 50 years ago. Okay, now we're just gonna talk a little bit about custom exempt. Uh, you know, in my mind, you know, your, your local meat lockers are an example of the, you know, custom exempt, you know, uh, they processed game animals, you know, in hunting season, uh, but, you know, they, pro they also process probably, excuse me, uh, cattle or hogs, you know, from local farmers. And they, you know, they're, they can do some stuff like the, the smoked meats and stuff like that. But, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not the expert on this. Elliot probably knows more about it than I do. So uh, he'll have to handle those questions. But legally, the custom exempt can only slaughter and process livestock for the exclusive use of the livestock owners, their household, their non paying guests, or their employees. Uh, they cannot, uh, and, these, and those meat products cannot be sold in commerce. You know, they're, they're, wrapped in, in butcher paper and and that and you know they don't have labels on them uh you know and, and and that and those facilities are subject to periodic inspections by usda or uh, local authorities to make sure that their sanitation is up to snuff and so forth okay the custom exempt uh typically the way it has uh, traditionally worked is that uh, producers may sell uh, uh, portions of, an, of a live animal, uh, for example, half a steer, or excuse me, a quarter of a steer or a half of a hog for something like that to several consumers uh, who, while the animal is still alive uh, and uh, uh, 
and you know when when the entire animal is sold then the buyers become co-owners of the animal uh the uh, livestock seller uh can then you know arrange for the uh animal that has been sold to the uh, slaughter and processing facility and then uh then each owner or co-owner of the animals are responsible for choosing how their portion should be processed. And then they also have to pay for their share of the animal and then pay the processing uh, facility for the, for the feed. But that's kind of how uh, the custom exempt uh, uh, process works on the uh, animal share model. And that is legal. I mean, there's, I don't think there's, USDA has any uh, issues or concerns about that. Um, you know, products that have been sold uh, or that have been processed under this, sold and processed under this uh, uh, custom exempt guidelines may not be sold or donated. Again, that the, the owner, that is the consumer, they can only use it for themselves, their family, their employees, their non-paying guests. Uh, they can't, you know, so if you run a bed and breakfast or something like that, you can't do the a, a custom exempt animal legally and then sell that to your, and then serve that meat to your paying customers. Uh, or if you're the, uh, a cafe with that, you know, that in the same town as the, as the uh, uh, meat locker, you know, that's, you can't, buy the stuff you can't get meat there for sale for sale to your paying restaurant customers that's you know it's pretty strict on that hard to pro hard to hard to enforce you know hard to find violations probably but you know that's what the rules are now wyoming has been the pioneer on this uh, herd share idea and uh, they have a hurdle, excuse me, a law that says allows uh, livestock owners to sell herd shares to live animals uh, uh, in an attempt to qualify for this custom exempt status. And uh, so, you know, you're, when you buy a, a share, you know, you've, you've got a, a share not of a specific animal, but of some animal in a specific herd or group of animals. And uh, obviously trying to uh, broaden uh, this, you know, one animal custom exempt uh, process that we've just been through, trying to extend, extend that to a group of animals rather than just a single animal. Uh, right now, uh, this is a, according to, uh, an ag media article that I found on Google or using Google, uh, the Food Safety Inspection Service is working with Wyoming officials to decide whether this herd share program uh, is legal under the Meat Inspection Act or not. And uh, we'll kind of have to wait and see on that, uh, presumably, uh, if SSIS signs off on it or wants some changes or something like that, we'll just kind of have to wait and see how that plays out and what they come up with. Uh, you know, we in Nebraska this past year uh, adopted, you know, a law, a herd share law that's patterned after the Wyoming law. Uh, but I think before, uh, I mean, if I were tempted to build a small processing facility in Nebraska to try to take advantage of this new herd share program, I think I would wait to see what happens in Wyoming uh, before I, you know, invested any money in that in that process. We'll just kind of have to wait and see how that plays out, and and uh, you know, I don't have any timeline or anything like that in terms of uh, when the USDA uh, evaluation of the herd share program in Wyoming, uh, when that all is going to play out. So I guess 
we'll, we'll just kind of have to be in a wait and see mode on that. So that's it for me, and I will toss it back to um, Elliot and let him uh, take it from there. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Charlie, for sharing some of your thoughts. Uh, we're going to open it up for questions. I know we've been getting some, some questions both in the chat box and the Q&A box. I'll go ahead and try to answer some of those and, and pass them off to Charlie and Dave. Uh, but before I do that, I do want to point your attention to something that was just posted in the chat um, from Ryan Evans, our communication specialist. And as I mentioned in my presentation that here at UNL, we're, we're trying to compile a list of all the custom exempt plants that actually are located in Nebraska. To do so, we've compiled a, um, a Google form that you can go to and click and provide the information uh, that uh, if you know of a custom exempt plant, and this is kind of a the first step of a larger effort to try to compile that um, so that we can provide information. Let's say you're um, in Ogallala and you're trying to find different custom exempt plants to go to um, and you can uh, go to a list like this and, and find that plant. Uh, I'll just go ahead and start it um, where I see it. Uh, Jessica said, um, is there any educational material showcasing yield loss based on grade of the animal? Um, it's hard to communicate how much meat you can get back out on an animal that was yield grade four, super fatty, and steaks will be wonderful, but a lot of fat was lost in trimming, so your meat yield at the end will not hit that 60% range. Um, I'm not aware of any information. The person that I'd probably refer you to would be Gary Sullivan, um, who is um, in the animal science department, he'd probably be better able to answer any yield loss ratio um, from certain types of meat. Uh, but what I would point is a different Beef Watch article uh, that was published by Randy Sainer and Brianna Boozman. Um, and this really helps walk through, we have this carcass and how it's broken down by the different uh, types of primals and subprimals. I'm going to go ahead and post that here in, in the chat box for everyone to have, but uh, it doesn't quite get at the question of, let's say we have a yield grade four carcass versus a, um, a yield grade two choice uh, and what that dressing percent would be. Um, so looks like Oren and Nick were talking a little bit about my presentation said that there is a small dot near Ogallala, but it's not listed on the current slide. Um, in the slide itself, it looks like that very small or the, uh, the plant was located. It was very, very, it was a very small plant located near Ogallala. Um, and it looked like it was um, neither a beef, pork, red meat or poultry product. Uh, so it would generally be under one of these non-conforming HACCP categories that would likely process game and, um, and different types of, of those types of products. Um, and Nick was asking about the difference between small, uh, very small, small and large. And maybe I'll pass it off to you, Charlie, to Yeah, uh, just the difference is the, the type, the size of the, uh, the facility itself and the different uh, inspections that they do is kind of based on the, the very small, what we call niche or boutique where they're doing some of the custom exempt in-house. Um, and then they're just there, it progresses based on the size of the facility and uh, kind of what that snapshot shot showed kind of showed you some of those similarities and differences of them that I can I can bring up or send out to. Yeah. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, that looks like Jared also had that same question. Um, I think it's a good point that you brought up that it's more about by size of the physical plan itself and not necessarily on slaughter days. Normally when we think about capacity or we talk about plant size, we're talking about slaughter how many 
animals they process per year or per day. Um, and on the Thursday presentation, uh, I'll be when I talk about meat processing plants there, um, as reported by USDA, I'll be actually look, I'll be showing how how it is by actual harvest capacity. Um, and oftentimes we we tend to focus more on that because we're thinking about throughput um, that happens throughout the year. Um, so uh, Catherine asked, um, do the numbers and uh, numbers and plant numbers include both slaughter and strictly fabrication plants? The answer to that is yes, they included both uh, fabrication and slar uh, harvest plants as well. Um, uh, Jared also asked, uh, so this is probably for you, Charlie. Can we get a breakdown of the $1.2 million construction cost? A lot has changed since the 2013, 2014, but the locker near me that was built only does three hogs per day, a total of 15 for their five day work week. Just curious between what they are and, um, and UNL's or UNO's numbers. Yeah, well, I, I don't have that broke out right this second. So, um, if you wanna reach out to me after the, webinar or the presentation, I'd be gladly to break that out for you. But I believe the, the cost, the price tag on the 1.2 was for a new new build construction. So. Hopefully that helps, Jared. Um, and then it says, uh, Jared also has another question, is the federal government doing anything to help meet small meat processing equipment manufacturers get developed or expand or help small meat plants become more automated? Um, what I am aware that we'll talk about more on this on Thursday about the different grant opportunities um, and Gary Sullivan will also talk about the specific grants, what's covered, what's not covered under there. So perhaps Jared, I'd, I'd refer you to, to that webinar. Although what, uh, what I think um, some of those grants are is that there are plants to help people actually become more automated and develop those. There is ear, ear tag for that, but confirm that with Gary on our, on our webinar on Thursday. Um, so someone posted that uh, poultry processing for very small producers seems to be a bottleneck. Will upcoming grant opportunities help with this situation? When we're talking about uh, uh, bottleneck situations. What, what I think about is the lack of capacity relative to the number of animals. Um, and so poultry, these grants that are that we'll talk about on Thursday are available for um, any really any size plant below I think 500 head per day or 400 head per day, um, and so I think that's exactly what those grant opportunities are looking for. They're trying to help develop out these small and very small types of processing plants. Um, Catherine said, uh, small four full-time employee or small 10 time full-time employee. Yeah, there's, I'm thinking you're referring to the HACCP uh, uh, classification. Um, what I've always seen is referred to with a, um, uh, with square footage. And it's important to note that uh, even FSIS says that um, square footage is not a strong, it's not strongly correlated with production and, and throughput. And so they're just using that as a, as a categorization for facility size. Um, so another person said that there are USDA grant programs for starting a facility. I'll defer that to the question for, for Gary and his Thursday webinar, where he'll actually go through and talk about the specific grant programs and what there are and what they're not available for. Um, and then Nick asked, this is probably for you, Dave, does HACCP um, in any way consider the number of employees uh, working in the plants? I don't know, but I, it seems to me that would likely be a, a, an important factor, but I don't know that it's necessarily uh, what determinants. I, I imagine it's probably a combination of employees, uh, how many animals going through, facility size, I imagine all those factor in. Yeah, and perhaps that was uh, Catherine's, what she was pointing to about four FTE and 10 FTE. 
Jessica provided some good information here. She said uh, a brand new plant 2020 build was 8,500 square feet for 2.6 million. Um, Jessica, maybe you could uh, you could span a little bit about uh, what uh, type of animals you guys are processing. Um, because uh, Charlie mentioned that that square cost per square foot was relative depending upon the commodity. But I'll go ahead and read that. It says, uh, construction costs have gone up since then. We have an all steel building, which would cost about 30% more expensive to build with current steel costs and several pieces of equipment were purchased. But we also bought an existing equipment we had from an old facility. So, okay, great. Thanks, Jessica. That's great. Great news. Uh, they process about 20 to 25 beef and 20 to 30 pigs per week with 15 employees. Awesome. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, well, it's at the conclusion. I, I would point you to both the, the webinar that we're going to be talking about on Thursday. Uh, we're going to be going specifically into the grants, what's they, what they cover, what they don't cover, and specifically what's that uh, process look like to actually apply uh, for those grants. And I'll be talking a little bit about, about why we have certain size plants and where those plants have actually um, been. But also uh, to point out, I would like to thank Charlie and Dave for taking time today to be with us. Appreciate their expertise. If you have questions for Charlie or Dave, please reach out to them. And, and I do want to mention that there will be a recording um, of this webinar, so you can go back and rewatch it if there's something you missed. Also, a podcast and a brief write up, and all of those will be available at cap.unl.edu. You, while you're there, you can also sign up for uh, other upcoming webinars, like the one talking about grant opportunities this Thursday. And we'll hope you'll you hope you'll join us. Ryan just posted a uh, um, a survey in the chat. If you could please click that, it's just a brief three question survey and it really just helps provide us feedback on the webinar and help us provide uh, upcoming uh, webinars that are relevant to the public. Thanks again for joining us and hope to see you on Thursday.